Listen now to the reading from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. Hear a reading from the 25th chapter. There was a man in Maon whose property was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was clever and beautiful, but the man was surly and mean. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing sheep, so David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. Thus you shall salute him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing. All the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your sight, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and the meat that I have butchered for my shearers and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword, and every one of them strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. About 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he shouted insults at them. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five sheep ready-dressed, five measures of parched grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and she loaded them on the donkeys and said to her young men, Go on ahead of me, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and alighted from the donkey and fell before David on her face, bowing to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. My lord, do not take seriously this ill-mannered fellow Nabal, for he is as his name is. So he is. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my lord whom you sent. Now then, my lord, as the lord lives and as you yourself live, since the lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance with your own hand, now let your enemies who seek to do your evil to my Lord be like Nabal. Now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespasses of your servant, for the Lord will surely make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. Evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If anyone should rise up to pursue you to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. When the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or no pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for having saved himself and when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Now David said to Ab Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you to me today. Blessed be your good sense, and blessed be you, who kept me today from blood guilt and from avenging myself by my own hand. 
For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there would have not been anyone left to Nabal so much as one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought, and he said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have heeded your voice, and I have granted your petition. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Well, this morning I want to start off with what I intend to be the first installment of a short little three-part sermon series this January and early February. And I want to base my little three-week series on John Wesley's three simple rules for Christian life. The background of the three simple rules are, is worth knowing. When John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, began to organize and to kind of work in the Church of England uh, to try to reform it and make it more uh, kind of mission-driven rather than a more of an... It was, Wesley felt it was kind of an exclusive group at the time. When Wesley wanted to reform the Church of England, of which he was a part, uh, he began in the 1730s to form little societies. That's what he, the term he used. But basically, they were small groups. They met weekly to study the Bible and to pray and to encourage one another in being faithful. And then they would always end their little prayer meetings and in spiritually encouraging meetings and go out and do some good. They would take a collection, go buy somebody out of debtor's prison. They would go give alms to the poor, food to somebody who needed it. Always that was the way in which those little societies ended. And that's how the Methodist movement began, with these little small groups in the 1730s. But what happened was when they first met, it wasn't long until uh, they sent word to Wesley, we need a little bit of guidance in terms of how we should organize. We need some rules. Uh, like most people, they didn't want arbitrary rules, and they didn't want too many rules, but they said, we just would like a little bit of guidance from you as to what these small groups ought to do and what they ought to look like. Could you give us a little bit of just the short rules for, for our structuring our life? And Wesley said, absolutely, I can. I'll give you three rules, basically. That's, uh, Reuben Jobes called them the three simple rules. Wesley just called them the three rules for the society. They've been included now in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, kind of our book of order, uh, for over 200 years. And the rules are simple. First, do no harm. Second, do good. And third, attend to the ordinances of God. That's the way Wesley put it, or uh, Reuben Job, uh, one of our bishops, uh, paraphrased it more helpfully. Stay in love with God. That's the way he phrased it. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Those are the goals. Those are the rules for the society. Actually, here's the language, John Wesley's actual language. It is expected of all who continue in Methodist societies that they should evidence their desire for salvation, first, by doing no harm, that is, by being in every kind merciful after your power, as you have opportunity. Okay, so that's, do, do no harm. Being merciful after your power, as you have opportunity. Second, by doing good of every possible sort, as far as possible to all. And third, by attending unto the ordinances of God. That is, in Job's language, attending to your spiritual life, staying in love with God. So for the next three weeks, what I want to do is look at each of those rules, one at a time, as a kind of way to start a new year with the assumption that Wesley's rules still have some teeth for Methodist people even to this very day. We're a long way from 1730 in some ways, but in other ways, people are people in every generation. And here are the ways. And uh, so uh, I thought it would be useful to see how these may apply to us. So today, subject number one, do no harm. And uh, I thought the starting place might be to give you ex specific examples that came from John Wesley's later writings as to what he meant by 
actions that would do harm to others. Uh, they include some of the things that you would expect a preacher in 1730 to say. Uh, to do no harm, that is to avoid taking the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, you do harm when you profane the Lord's day. That is, you, you, know, you don't attend to the uh, Sunday worship. Uh, drunkenness, which Wesley defined as drinking of spiritous liquors. And then he adds a curious phrase, except in cases of extreme necess necessity. Now, that's interesting. <laughs> or drinking wine or ale to excess, though you may be interested to know that Wesley himself uh, did drink wine and ale. It was common. It was just common you know, for meals. And he even published some tips in one of his pamphlets on home brewing. Uh, but that's for another day. That's for um, fighting. Quarreling, brawling, brother going to law against brother, returning evil for evil, railing for the sake of railing. Uh, those were uh, all ways in which we do harm. Giving or taking things on usury, that is borrowing or lending for interest. Doing unto others as we would not they should do unto us. Putting on of gold or costly apparel, softness, and needless self-indulgence, laying up treasures on earth. And then, and this is interesting, for 1730, uh, Methodist people, the buying or selling of slaves. Let's think about that. That's 130 years before the Civil War. Methodist, me, no, no slave owners. And then uncharitable or unprofitable conversation, particularly speaking evil of ministers. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's Wesley's list. That was Wesley's list. And here's, as I look back on that, I would suggest to you today that they fall into three basic categories. Uh, first, do no harm to yourself. Uh, treat yourself as a person worthy of care and healthy behavior. Abstain from things that make you unhealthy. And I think Wesley would say, you do that not just because you'll feel better, uh, uh, but because when you are stronger physically, uh, the longer you can be a force for good and a servant of God. It's a theme that's echoed. You know, you find that in the Bible. Your body is the temple of God, Paul says to the Corinthians. And, and how you treat your body, both the New Testament and John Wesley echoes here, is a spiritual matter. Uh, I think he believed that. In fact, in many ways, Wesley was ahead of his time in counseling people to, to attend to their physical health. His, his best-selling book, which actually far outsold anything he ever wrote, was a book called uh, Primitive Physic, which was a book of homeopathic remedies of varying kinds for health. Uh, he had um, in this book uh, uh, things about uh, practicing a lot. Uh, you could do um, uh, poultices on your head to grow hair, and, and uh, uh, he, he very much advocated uh, 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 exercise. He told his, um, he told his uh, niece who was ill, go out and walk as much as you can stand to, uh, which was part of his way of saying, practice a lifestyle that in the long run is good for yourself. Not so you look good, that, that, but, but so you are, you're strong for the service of God. It's a sign of respect for your, the gift God has given you of this body, and you want to be the strongest, most capable soul you can be. So, so Wesley says, do no harm to yourself. And then immediately goes on to say, and don't do harm to anybody else either, which he defined uh, in the briefest of ways is uh, doing unto others as we would not, they should do unto us. Fighting them, bragging, engaging in speech that denigrates somebody else, reacting in anger, to slights that come our way as a kind of a knee-jerk response. Wesley knew as well as anybody that, that, that people can be difficult and that life would bring you moments when others are provoking you and when the, there's a temptation uh, not to think through and, and give a measured response to somebody who's irritating us, but instead just to react with anger and hostility. And he said, don't do it. You have an obligation not to just react when somebody's getting under your skin, but to think about the, you know, literally that answer, what would Christ do in this situation? And to be not just reactive, but measured in your response. 
And the great biblical example for that, I think maybe the best in all the Bible, is that obscure story from Abigail, most of which I read you today. Abigail is one of, I think, the unsung heroes of the Old Testament. Had you ever heard her story before? Uh, not everybody has, uh, but, but they should, because Abigail is the one who basically saves King David from his own worst instincts to do harm to somebody who has offended him, this man named Nabal. And if he had followed through on his own knee-jerk instincts to overreact to the insult that he gets, he likely would never would have become Israel's king. And, and interestingly enough, as you, if you've heard that story, if you, uh, it's not that Nabal didn't deserve a hostile response. Because in the story, I mean, Nabal certainly comes off as one of the, the bigger jerks in the Old Testament. And there are several in there, you know. Uh, Nabal is, is Abigail's husband. And incidentally, do you know, in, in Hebrew, Nabal means fool, uh, which is, says something about what Nabal's family thought of him. Uh, but the interesting part of the story, despite the fact that Nabal uh, was, was foolish, according to both his, uh, his family and, and those around him, somehow he manages to get rich. Uh, the story begins, Nabal possessed 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Uh, that would put him solidly in the, you know, one percenter category, a member of the uh, financial elite of his day. And, and David enters the story as this impoverished young, kind of a guerrilla fighter who has come to Nabal with a, with a particular request. David's not king yet. He's assembled this kind of group of soldiers that are hanging out on the, in the wilderness on the periphery of the kingdom, hoping for the chance to take Saul's throne someday. And at one point, David sends some messengers to Nabal, reminding him that Nabal's big sheep herd grazing out in the fields have been protected by David's men from attack for, for many months now. David has been kind of carefully watching over Nabal's flock, and, and he sends an envoy, David does, reminding Nabal of this service that he's been providing and suggests the feast day is coming, and it would be nice, Nabal, you having so much, and, and we this ragtag bag of, a band of, 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 uh, of uh, starving uh, mercenaries on the edge of the, the wilderness, if you could send us a little meal as a thank you. That would be really nice. Could you give us maybe a sheep that we could roast and, and that, just for, as a thank you for keeping the herds intact? And, and Nabal is rich enough. He could have easily done this. You know, that give, it's kind of like a gratuity uh, for, for, the, for the service rendered. But, uh, but he um, instead slams the door basically, in, Davis, in the face of uh, David's emissaries. Who is David, he said, who is Jesse's son, that I should take my bread and my wine and the meat that I have butchered for my shears and give it to people who came from who knows where? That's the answer. No. Uh, and word gets back to David that, that this is, you know, not only has he been turned down, but he's been turned down in this kind of insulting way. And uh, immediately, David's machissimo, we have the biggest overreaction in the Bible. He, he says, everybody put on your swords. We are going to go and there will not be one man standing when we are done. Nothing a good fight can't solve, right? Uh, so uh, that's what they decide to do. Uh, and um, he has repaid me evil instead of good. May God deal harshly with me, David says. And worse still, if I leave alive even one single male come morning. So it looks for all the world, like we're going to have one of those Old Testament mass slaughters coming next. And we would have without Abigail. That's, she saves the day. In the story, she is the one person who doesn't act like a fool. Uh, in fact, she is the, the exact uh, opposite uh, 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 of, of the impulsive response. She is the embodiment of Wesley's rule to do no harm. Uh, because she goes to... Um, to David and basically says, you know, it's not enough to fight for your principles. You need to live up to your principles. Uh, and, and, and she's heard because she, she, first of all, softens him up. She brings the food that he needs and she brings some gifts that she uh, wants him to have. And uh, she finds him and, and she gives in the Old Testament. It's the longest speech a woman gives in all the Old Testament is Abigail's speech to David. Pay no attention to this despicable Nabal. He is exactly what his name says he is, fool. 
When the Lord has done all the good things he has promised to you, she says to David, and he has installed you as Israel's leader, don't let this be a blot or a burden on your conscience that you shed blood needlessly or that you took vengeance into your own hands. Think about this. Do you want to be known as the guy who overreacted over the, the fact you didn't get a tip and killed all these people because... Can you, you should think about this. Do you want this to be your legacy? That's what she's, think about this, this woman coming to him, the guerrilla fighter, you know, all ready to go to war, saying, don't just overreact. You could be measured, in, be mature, live, live up to your principles. Don't just fight for them. And lo and behold, in what I would maintain is one of the great miracle stories of the Old Testament, he listens. He, t- he takes this counsel, and, and, and it, he says to her, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you to me today. And blessed be you and your good judgment for preventing me from shedding blood and taking vengeance into my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, the one who kept me from hurting you, if you hadn't come quickly and met up with me, there wouldn't be one single male left come morning. That's the story. The rest of the story is kind of interesting, too. I didn't have it read, but the story ends like this. Abigail returns home, and she finds Nabal in a drunken stupor, and when he finally sobers up the next day, she tells him what she's done. She's gone to David, given him the tip, told him not to hurt anybody, and Nabal is so incensed that he gets up, and he's ranting around, and he clutches his chest, and he collapses of a heart attack, and within 10 days, he's dead. And, and David takes Abigail as his second of eight wives. When he becomes king, Abigail remains his trusted counselor, the trusted voice at his side. So, I mean, aside from the obvious implication of the story that it's not wise to marry a fool, no matter how rich he is, uh, I, the real takeaway, the real takeaway is all about doing no harm and seeing your obligation to live every day kind of cognizant of the values that you want to have characterize your life as a whole. It's interesting to think about. How, would our cultural life be different if every one of us, at least every one of us in church in, in every town, took seriously that our role is not to overreact when we're offended, but to be measured and to, do no, to think about, first, do no harm. Let me see if I can not just react, but think about the values that I want to have characterize my life so that I don't just run off in some random direction. And, and as Wesley counseled that, uh, do no harm, not to yourself, take care of your body, take care of yourself and exercise and eat right, and, take, and, and don't, harm, don't harm others either. And then the last part of doing no harm that Wesley talked about is what I would call the, the lifestyle um, options of doing no harm, not just to ourselves or not just to others, but to God. Wesley believed that we could harm God and the things God loves to harm creation. He believed harms God to pollute needlessly, to overconsume needlessly. Uh, you remember that slogan back from the 1970s, uh, live simply so that others can simply live. Wesley, he taught that 200 years before it was popular. Uh, Wesley was a person who actually uh, accumulated quite a large uh, uh, financial empire. As he was a, a prolific writer. He sold books. That's what he mostly, uh, where his, most of his income came. But you know, Wesley decided early on as a young man how much he needed to live what he considered to be an adequate life, how much he needed to spend on clothing. He had a modest flat in London where he lived. It was not by any means elaborate. And Wesley was a person who said, this is about as comfortable as I need to be in my life. And as his wealth came in, he just maintained his level of, of lifestyle, gave all the rest away. He believed that lifestyle was an important aspect of faithfulness and that we all need to kind of see respect for others and respect for creation as it's evidenced in our lifestyle as a spiritual issue. So those, that's how we began, uh, Methodists did. Three simple rules. First, do no harm. Second, do good. Third, stay in love with God. And I would maintain they are still uh, wor- rules worth living by. And it just makes me think sometimes, what if, what if every Methodist in the country, you know, there are like nine million of us uh, out there, if we, all of us got up tomorrow, began our day uh, 
with, with that in mind. First today, I will do no harm. I will treat myself as God's temple. I will be careful not to actively or passively participate in, in behaviors that harm others. And I will do my best not to harm God's creation today. Uh, would people notice the difference? They might, you know. I, I believe that, that we might make a difference in all of that. Uh, and there's only one way to find out. Uh, may God uh, call us uh, to that kind of a life, doing no harm. And maybe for this, just this day, uh, respond, Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. Amen.